We have to discuss again. We, I, take, I take the same school book, the same school book, and uh, look the next page, and then I find this uh, picture. You have the uh, deep holes. Here is the deep hole, and you see the coming off of the electromagnetic field lines from the deep hole, from the excited deep hole. And what you see is that they are forming vortices. These are, these are not, it's not a wave, it's a vortex. What the, what the uh, deep hole is uh, sending off. So, uh, what is the next vortex doing with the, with the last one? It's pushing. It's pushing the, the old one. That means that uh, antennas are radiating field vortices as a shock, shock wave, as a standing wave, as a longitudinal wave. This is a longitudinal wave, you see. Uh, you, you know by the sound wave. The sound wave, um, there is one air particle pushing the next. And this gives a standing wave or a, a shock wave. And this is what we see here. This is is uh, the pushing of one vortex to the next. And uh, so we come to the result that uh, the dipole is only um, sending uh, scalar waves, no transverse waves. But there is something, something happens between the so-called near field and the far field. And if... Um, in the, in the far field, if I'm far away, that's not very uh, long distance, that's uh, the wavelengths divided to 2p, that's divided to, to 6 about. So uh, that's uh, not a long way uh, to go. And then the long, longitudinal um, part of the wave nearly is zero, uh, so, you, so it's neglectable. And the rest is the uh, transverse wave. And there is something changing. And I can explain, or could explain it in that way, uh, that I say uh, the tra in the transition between the near field and the far field, the vortices unroll uh, up to a wave. And then they are propagating as an electromagnetic wave. But in the near field soon, everybody, every specialist on high frequency technology knows that it is not allowed, he says, it is not possible, I would say, to measure the, the electromagnetic wave as there is not, none. There is none. But what is there? This is the next question. Um, if, if I have this approach that the, the, field, the, the field vortex breaks up to, to a wave, uh, at the receiver, the opposite thing happens, that at the end of the antenna, the wave is reflected, running back, and you get a vortex again. So it's rolling up, the wave is rolling up at the uh, uh, receiver, at the antenna of the receiver, rolling up to a vortex. And so you have just the opposite thing. Um, uh, and uh, if you want to describe this as you don't need any energy to form the vortex into the wave or back the wave into a vortex, you don't need, need energy. Uh, both um, are stable um, structures. Uh, then I can use, or I, I shall use this picture, this model, that I bundle up, or that I roll up, roll up the electromagnetic wave to a vortex that running with the speed of light, the constant speed, uh, and uh, around the magnetic field pointer. They are perpendicular to each other, you see, and perpendicular to both is the electric field pointer, and this has to be in this direction. So if you are moving this vortex in the direction of the electric field, then you have a longitudinal wave. This is uh, standard. But uh, there happens something, and I want to discuss this. Longitudinal waves run in the direction of the field pointer. 
uh, with a field pointer, the vector of velocity oscillates, you see. Um, the faster uh, the oscillating vortex is, the smaller it gets. That has to do with the Lorentz construction, contraction, because we have uh, speeds nearly uh, near to the speed of light. So uh, the, the Lorentz construct, uh, contraction um, uh, Einstein has uh, used in his uh, theory of relativity, this works at this point. That means the diameter reduces this, the higher the speed will be. And uh, uh, this is what I've, I've shown here on the right side. The diameter uh, reduces the quicker it is. And if it's get, getting slower, then it's getting bigger again. So uh, the diameter always is moving of these uh, scalar waves, of these vortex systems. And the vortex permanently changes diameter and wavelength. And as you know, that, the, that we, we have the relation that the frequency is the speed of light divided to the wavelength. Uh, by this, if the wavelength is changing and the speed of light is constant, the frequency is changing as well. And the result is that the vortex acts, acts as a frequency converter. So that is vortex physics. Yes, I think uh, the universities uh, have forgotten uh, in, this, in the last century. Uh, but it is very important to know that what a vortex always is a frequency converter. So the result is the measurable mixture of frequencies are called noise. Let me go back to the example, I have an antenna. Let me say it has an efficiency of about 80%. 80% means you are not able to measure 80% because you have to be in the far field, you, in a, you measure in a distance. And then you calculate back to the surface of the antenna, you calculate back and say, okay, with the law of the distance, uh, it, has, it is 80%. 80%. Uh, what, what about the 20%, 20% losses? Well, these 20% are the noise. That's the noise, the noise of an antenna. And this is the scalar wave part. This is important. This is scalar wave part is the noise. And you know that every antenna is producing noise. This is what you are able to measure everywhere. And uh, if you measure in the near field zone, you measure only noise, 100% noise. And of these 100%, 80% crack up, roll up from the vortex to the, to the field, to the, to the wave, and the rest remain vortices. And if the, if the vortex, vortex decays, then it gives losses. And these losses are measured. 